Good morning, everyone. Thanks for Nicole for getting us all squared away here too. Uh, I appreciate you joining us for our COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Kristen Ullenbrock and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy, a project at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I'm coming to you from snowy Denver, Colorado, which I'm sure many of our Colorado colleagues are. Um, and this nice little welcome respite is really needed, I know, for all the wildfires that we have going on across the state. Um, so I'm very thankful for the snow this morning. I do want to also be thankful and recognize our partners in this series, the Colorado School of Public Health. A huge thank you to them, and in particular, Dr. John Samet, and we're in a treat for a treat today because Dr. Samet is with us again. So today's episode is an open forum, which I'm sure many of you are aware of since you're tuning in, uh, and we have four leading experts here in Colorado to take your questions. So how do you ask questions? Well, open that chat if you're in Zoom and if you're letting us know where you're watching from, that's great, we love to see that. That's gonna be where you ask us your questions. If you're joining us on Facebook this morning, good morning, and also use that comment feature to ask your questions. As Nicole mentioned, if you were here before we got started, we have a ton of questions. Um, since we started this back in April, we have not been able to answer all of your questions. We're very well aware of that. And so today's episode is trying to do that justice, although we not, will not be able to complete that task. I'm very sure of that. Um, but we're gonna be taking as many questions as possible over the next 45 minutes, including questions here in real time. So I've said this a few times, but I know y'all are keenly aware that this pandemic is really about science unfolding in real time, meaning we're seeing science and research in action. This also means that new information comes available, and so we're here to hopefully update you on some of that. It also means that you're going to have questions where the answer is, we still don't know. Um, but there is a lot that we do know, and there's much that has gotten refined over this time. So we encourage questions of all shapes and variety today. I'm going to turn this over to our guests. Um, and they're going to try to answer as many questions as possible, including tough ones for you, um, but we're not going to get to all of them. Um, so huge thank you to everyone that's been joining us over the months and engaging um, along the way. I'm also going to introduce our guests this morning to kick us off. We have four esteemed guests, and I am not going to do, their just, do them justice in my intro to their bio. We have Dr. Michelle Barron. She was an early guest for ours where she talked about vaccines and therapeutics, I think back in May when we started. She's a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center and the Medical Director of Infection Control at UC Health. Dr. Barron's research interests are the infection prevention and control, transplant infectious diseases and HIV. We also have Dr. Jude Baham joining us. He is also one of our early guests. He is an economist and assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Colorado State University. He's been involved in some of the modeling efforts here going on with our state on COVID-19, and his research interests are at the intersection of public policy, human health, and the natural environment. We have a new guest joining us today, Dr. Neil Epperson. She is the Robert Friedman Endowed Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado Andrews Medical Campus. Dr. Epperson is internationally known for her unique lifespan approach to women's reproductive and behavioral health in both the clinical and research realms, including a greater appreciation of the impact of childhood adversity on psychological responses during times of hormonal fluctuation. I also saw and found out that she has this podcast, we'll drop the link in at the end of today's episode, called Mind the Brain, Mental Health in the Time of COVID-19. And our final guest joining us today probably doesn't need much introduction. He's joined us a couple times. It is Dr. John Samet, who is the Dean of the Cara School of Public Health. Dr. Samet is a pulmonary physician and epidemiologist and serves as a professor within the school's Department of Epidemiology and the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. His research focuses on the health effects of inhaled pollutants, and he's been leading a lot of our COVID-19 modeling results here for the state. So we're going to jump into your questions very quickly, but before we do, we are going to take just a couple minutes and have John give us a really quick update via some slides on the state COVID-19 outlook so that we have some data to kick us off with. So good morning, John. Welcome. And do you want to kick us off with some data? That's good. Uh, good morning, everyone. And let me... Uh get things up and running here. I'm going to give you a lightning fast um, overview of where things stand in Colorado and what the uh, latest modeling uh, results show. And as a reminder, the modeling results um, are uh, posted. Go to the School of uh, Public Health and you'll find them. So just a uh, quick sweep uh, across the US and globally. Uh, the picture, of course, is uh, a uh, 
terrifying one in some senses. Globally, over a million deaths. The United States, we've reached 225,000. And of course, the uh, pandemic has reached across the um, United States. In fact, I saw yesterday in the New York Times an article uh, showing that uh, the rates are now highest in rural areas, and particularly in some of the states uh, to the uh, north and west uh, of us. This is Colorado, and I'm showing you the cases over time and the deaths. Of course, we're now in sort of the third wave in the state of Colorado, which is of, uh, of concern, perhaps many explanations for it, uh, the return to schools and colleges and universities, uh, going back inside, and perhaps all of us having some uh, COVID fatigue and being less adherent to the uh, infection control measures that we need to be uh, taking. Our state has had uh, 94,000 cases reported. That's only a fraction of those that have actually taken place. We estimate that about 8% of Coloradans have been infected. And we are at about uh, 2,200 deaths uh, in the state from COVID-19. The epidemic, and we've talked about this in the series, has affected uh, different groups in the states in different ways. And now, as in the uh, past, our Hispanic uh, population continues to have the highest rates. Uh, and you'll note that's held up across uh, the course of the months of the pandemic in the state. Rates in the American Indian and Alaska Natives fluctuate because of small numbers, but have also been high. The uh, modeling is based around the hospitalizations. And what we do is we fit these curves, which uh, you can see here week after week after week as the hospitalizations accumulate. Roughly for the last three weeks, we've been on this rising curve with this uh, twist upwards, curve upwards, that's consistent with having R, the reproductive number, well above one now, running around 1.5. What that means is for each person who's infected, there are 1.5 new cases. So over time, with this exponential rise, the uh, epidemic curve will continue um, upwards. So we use this curve that we fit to model what will happen. And I'll just say that um, over time, we are describing what's happening with something called transmission control We've just been doing um, less and less well. We'd like that number to be somewhere around 78, 80% to keep the epidemic from spiraling, but it's below that at about 66, 67%. Across the state, when we look at hospitalizations, we see that there are many regions of the state where hospital numbers are trending up. And you can see that here, and we've highlighted some of those uh, areas, including the Denver uh, metro area, which of course counts for a large uh, proportion of the state's population. Now, just some very quick scenarios. And this is where we project forward and say, what if, what could happen? Right now, we are on this sort of dark green, let me get my arrow, trajectory right here. We don't want to get on any worse trajectory. And what we want to do is move to a better trajectory. This is cases, this is a need for intensive care units. So we developed these what if scenarios because we don't want them to happen. And our guidance is we're on this curve, we need to get off of it. And how does that happen? That comes through more measures to uh, reduce transmission. One of our worries, and I'll just skip to this, one of our worries is the coming holidays. We're basically a month out from the start of the Thanksgiving uh, Christmas uh, holidays, when people travel, when people tend to uh, mix. And these are projections where we take what is happening now and we add on the addition of the holidays. And I'm not gonna take you through these in any uh, detail, but what I want you to notice, this is our ICU bed capacity roughly for COVID-19 too many of these peaks, too many of these scenarios are going above that line. So it takes some weeks for measures that reduce transmission to have effects. So right now with a month out from the ho holidays and these kinds of scenarios, there's a real imperative for action. And I think that's action on the part of 
all of us, um, and also, of course, our local public health agencies uh, and the state through the uh, CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So last, just as a reminder, masks work. Uh, wear it one correctly, maintain physical distancing, uh, hand and face hygiene, following public health orders, supporting contact tracing, and of course, uh, time for flu shots. And stay tuned for our November 9th episode when uh, we will be talking about influenza and uh, COVID-19. So with uh, that, I think we are um, off to uh, answering your questions. To the races, so they say, John. John, let me throw a question at you that came in, and then we're going to go to some polls. So everyone, get ready to answer some polls here. Um, can you explain the parent causes of the waves that we've seen in COVID nineteen? Because we see a couple waves. We've had one, two, now we're going into a third wave. Yeah, I, I think the easy answer is I wish I could. Uh, many of us felt the July wave might have, in part, reflected the July Fourth holiday weekend uh, when people did mix, that was sort of well-documented uh, by anecdote. And that wave came and went, if you remember, and it peaked around July 20th, roughly, and then dropped off. And perhaps that was a good explanation. Now we face too many potential explanations, uh, I think, including our K-12 colleges, universities, colder weather returning inside, and uh, more. And we just can't sort out which one it might be, and most likely it's all of the above plus more. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're gonna bring the audience into this because we've had a number of questions about restaurants. So Nicole, we're gonna have a, send you all a poll. Um, I know you can't answer it in Facebook, but feel free to write your response um, into the chat. So we're curious from you as our audience viewers, what are your current dining out habits? And this is anonymous, of course. Um, I only eat at home. I will occasionally order takeout or delivery. I will occasionally eat outside at a restaurant. I will occasionally eat indoors at a restaurant. I have no problem eating at a restaurant. So we'll give you just a few seconds here if you wanna pop in your responses. And then our guests are going to respond to those too. So good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Jude. Good morning, Neil. Nice to have you. Nicole, do you wanna go ahead and show those? I've got a number. Okay, so a majority of folks are ordering takeout or delivery, and I would say the next folks are occasionally eating outside. Um, we do have a few folks who do eat indoors and very few who seem to have no problem with it. I'm curious from each of you, and let me start um, with Michelle, then Jude, then Neil, then John. I wanna all of you respond. What are your dining out habits? What are some of your thoughts to what you see there in the polls? Um, I get takeout pretty frequently, so definitely takeout I feel is safe and reasonable. Um, I have eaten out twice, outdoors only, and uh, early, sort of in the summer of months when things were sort of trending down and I felt like it was safe. I don't know that I would do it now. I feel really a bit more anxiety, and I think also I worry just about mask usage, it being proper and getting into conflict, so I just try to avoid this. Yeah. Jude, what about you? Do you eat at a restaurant? Yes, um, pretty similar to Michelle, I think. Um, you know, we, we do uh, order takeout on occasion. I'm also in a multi-generational household. So we have my, my wife's parents live with us. And so we really try to minimize any connections um, uh, that we can, so. Mm -hmm. Neil, how's your risk level? Um, I'm pretty anxious. So um, I've eaten outside a couple of times. Um, but probably now that it's cold, not doing that anymore. And um, I, we do take out quite a bit. We, that's something we have two adult daughters with us and um, we work a lot of hours and they work a lot of hours. And so takeout seems to be something that everybody's pretty comfortable with. And John? I'm right there with my other colleagues. Uh, yeah. We've eaten out twice after a little bit of scouting about what it, um, look like and uh, felt fine and um, safe. I think returning indoors is something different. And again, goes back to how are we operating our buildings? Are we ventilating enough and uh, so on? Yeah, same here. And I've also heard it's 
you know, people don't know how a particular building or restaurant is doing ventilation, right? And that's something that's really hard to ask or understand in advance before you could go into a building. Um, so it's very variable there. All righty, we're going to do one more poll and then we're going to take a number of questions on vaccines and that stage because I know you all have it there. So questions there. So Nicole, throw up our vaccine poll. Let's poll our audience and then we're going to turn this over to Michelle. Um, if a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 were available today, and this is presuming that the vaccine has been presumed safe um, by health officials and is available to you, would you get one? Definitely get the vaccine, probably, probably not, definitely not get the vaccine. Michelle, I'm gonna want you to comment on that and then I'm gonna go ahead and pull up a question for you too on vaccines so you can take two for here while Nicole's letting people respond and closing that out. Wow, 61% would definitely get a vaccine and 28 probably would get the vaccine, which we're looking at, I mean, 89% of our audience today. And we've got almost 300 people on Zoom here. Do you wanna comment on that? Cause that is very different than I think some of the national polling we've been seeing. I think that's really fantastic. And I think the key probably to the statement was that it's safe and that everybody feels like it's safe. And I think the efficacy question might be a little bit harder, but I think the safety issue has been out there. And so I, I think that was probably the key statement that may or may have not swayed the people on this poll regarding their responses, mine included, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we had a question from Harry. Um, we talk about getting a vaccine, but there are a batch of vaccines in development. What would be the impact of having several vaccines with different actions? And how would people know which one to choose if there was multiple available to them to choose from? So we're gonna make the presumption that they're all safe and that there's obviously some data in terms of how they work. And so how we determine they, who they go to will probably depend on how they work. We know certainly with other vaccines that people over the age of 65 sometimes have less of a response. So maybe some of them will have better responses in those age groups and then we'd want to use it for them. Um, I think a lot of this will just be figuring it out. I think the first line is going to really be the health workers that are potentially exposed. And so I think that's going to be the first group. And I think we'll hopefully have figured it out once we get to the large public, once they're available. Great. And a follow on from Gail. Is the projected effectiveness of a COVID vaccine expected to be like that of a flu vaccine? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> I don't actually know that answer. I don't know if John wants to comment on it, but I don't know that I know that answer. I don't think anybody knows at this point. A lot of it will depend on how well it works and how well people's responses are. Mm -hmm. Um, Neil, let me ask you, this is a behavioral one, um, and it's okay if you don't know the answer to this, but so you get a vaccine and you take it, when do you change your isolation habits? Well, that's a very good question, and I don't really have an answer to that because I think we still don't know that we have a safe vaccine as of, uh, as of yet, and so, and how long do they work, and part of the testing is trying to understand uh, when, you know, after getting the vaccine, are you actually able to be around other people um, to be exposed without getting um, the infection? So I think there's a lot that's unknown, unfortunately, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, as much as possible, we have to stick to these other, um, you know, public health prevention strategies until we know that we have a safe and effective vaccine. John, can you take this one we have from Heather, which is talking about the emergency use authorization. So maybe take just a brief second to explain that to folks. And then um, her question is, what do you think of the emergency use authorization mechanism for approving a vaccine, especially in light of the experience with emergency use authorization for other medications so far? Well, it's a complicated, uh, complicated question. And of course, we have had emergency use authorization for a number of therapeutics, and perhaps uh, Michelle can comment there. I mean, I, I think FDA has made a clear statement that they will look for a minimum efficacy of 50%, that they want sufficient follow-up in the uh, phase three trials to assure that there's no uh, unexpected adverse uh, effects. And I, I think going back to our poll, I think the public is going to be looking for assurance of safety, uh, regardless of the regulatory path that brings the vaccine to the people. And I don't know, perhaps, Michelle, you would want to comment further, but. Uh. Yeah, so that's actually, so the governor has a committee that's actually looking 
advisory group specific to the vaccine. And these conversations have been had, public health officials actually see all sorts of different types of people on this committee. And that's the key is that we want to have the data in front of us, we want assurances that it's safe, efficacious, and then kind of go from there. But the way from the FDA will obviously be potentially necessary. But I think at the end of the day, this group, and I think this is not unique to Colorado, everybody wants to have access to the data and the assurance that you know, minimal measures of safe, not minimal, but, you know, the measures of safety and efficacy are met before we would ever recommend them. Great. Michelle, let's do one more on kids here. Um, what's the process for de determining a COVID-19 COVID vaccine that will work on kids? And I mean, the person wants to know we'll be ready next no. year, but, you know, that's an no, open-minded it, question, it's too. It's going to be some time, obviously, because kids are not even in the group right now. And so pediatric vaccines are a whole level of um, regulatory things that have to go through to be able to use those. Since they're not considered the highest risk from complications, I think that's why they were left off this initial round. But I know there are certainly studies that are going to be looking at that in the future. They just haven't started yet. I think the idea was get the people that are most likely to get hospitalized and died, protect them first, and then we can figure out the reservoir after that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. Um, we do have the head of psychiatry at CU and she's with us. And we've done an episode on mental health in the past and mental health has come up a lot in a lot of our episodes. Um, so we're gonna do a couple more polls again, just to kick off our discussion for mental health. Nicole, do you wanna throw up our first poll here? Again, so be prepared to throw in your answer so we can make these tidy, my audience members, which is on a scale of one to 10. You may have to expand this if it's not expanded for you. What is your stress level? Is it one, where you're not really stressed, feeling pretty good today, maybe the snow has calmed you down, um, or 10, you will feel extremely stressed today. Um, go ahead and put in that. We're going to have a follow-on poll to this too. So this is a two-part and then we're going to talk about it. We have folks in the chat who are at a five. All right, Nicole, why don't we go ahead and throw those up there? That's a quick and easy answer for people. A lot of folks kind of piling here in the middle, not over extremely stressed, it looks like. So hopefully that's a good sign. Um, but definitely some level of stress anxiety. And I'm sure all this is very relative to who we are as an individual and how we, you know, cope and deal. So um, we've got one more mental health question for you. Um, which of the following have been most, most stressful? being unable to socialize easily with friends and family, worrying about getting infected or infecting someone else with COVID-19, financial stability, or all of the above. I have a circumspect guess on where people are gonna fall on this, but it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> Great. So the top two are being unable to socialize easily and worrying about infecting yourself or someone else with COVID-19 um, and all of the above. So Neil, what do you think? I mean, you, you've been talking about this a lot. What, what do some of these results speak to you about? What does this mean? Well, I'm a, I'm a little concerned that 40%, uh, more than 40% were in that six or above on their stress scale because, I mean, that suggests that they are on that end of the being very stressed. And I think that that reflects what we're seeing globally. Um, I've been reading a lot of literature from China, Italy, a lot of other countries, um, folks in the EU, as well as here in the United States. And I can say in our clinical practices, we are seeing a high level of stress and particularly with frontline uh, providers, and I'm sure Michelle has had a lot of contact with the frontline providers in our critical care units, people doing shift work, um, they're just mentally and physically exhausted. And I think that the social isolation, that getting to that part where, you know, not being able to be with friends and family regularly also ties into that fear of getting COVID or giving someone else COVID. So it's hard to know. I mean, how many people can be in my bubble? Um, how many people can I socialize with in person safely? And that lack, that 
that fear is something that I think really drives people to have a lot more anxiety. Um, so I would really love to hear from John what he thinks and Michelle, what they think about, you know, who can be in your bubble? How many people as we move into the winter and into the holidays? Because one of the things that we've seen globally is that if there's not very clear cut messaging about what people can and can't do relatively safely, then that raises everybody's level of anxiety much more. And I think we've seen that in our country in specific. Should you wear a mask? Could you not wear a mask? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? And I think what we're trying to say here is that wearing a mask and social distancing is something that is saving lives. It is keeping people from being infected. But at the same time, social isolation is really not good for human mental health. It's one of the things that we crave as social human beings um, is to be with other people. So how do we do that safely and have a clear cut message about that? You know, I might just um, offer a couple of quick comments. Of course, we had an order on Friday or a measure the, and proposed that no more than two households should gather and the total should not exceed um, 10. Uh, I mean, I think we all have, and I saw this run through the chat, quote, COVID fatigue. I think it's real. And, uh, and we probably should get some reflections uh, from uh, Neil and uh, in particular on, um, on this phenomenon. But, you know, wearing masks and, uh, and maintaining distancing remains so critical as we see the curve surge up again. And I think particularly for those people who are in the susceptible, a susceptible group for one reason or another, where their age or underlying illness, you just have to be very cautious um, right now, because as we know, many young people can be asymptomatic, but able to infect others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think the answer to the question about COVID fatigue is that, you know, one, picking the things that you feel like you can have control over. And, and if you do feel that you can be with another family and just um, saying, okay, these are the people that we're gonna socialize with. And we trust that these people are only socializing with us. Um, pick that group of people or that one or two families, how, however you feel comfortable. But if you're an older person and prone or you have a pre-existing condition, at this point, giving it another few months, um, as tired as we are of this, trying to really say, okay, we need to get through the winter and I can control my situation through the winter. Um, and, and focusing on that, I think Jude, you were talking about you guys, even though you're younger, you're being incredibly careful because you have older um, parents living with you. And I think that everybody has to make those decisions for themselves um, and do the best they can to really say, okay, this is what I can do. And, you know, Zooming as much as I, am, I have Zoom fatigue, it is what we can do right now while we're in these winter months. Neil, can you also respond on some, um, we had a question regarding techniques for people to calm themselves, um, including things such as tapping or, you know, what can they do to calm their somatic system and boost their ability to sleep? As someone who also suffers from COVID somnia, which I think there's a term for that now, um, what are some actual tips you give people here who's tuned in today? Well, I want to tell people that one, to have some compassion for yourself because you are not alone. Oh my God, this is a worldwide problem. When you look at all the data, insomnia seems to be one of the biggest symptoms that people consistently complain of. Um, particularly of frontline clinicians, um, but also in the general population. So it's elevated in the general population from what it was before. And we actually have data showing that it's increased from what it was right before the stay at home orders or the lockdowns in some other countries. And it's even worse in frontline healthcare providers. So all I can say is that, yes, it is awful. I mean, people think crazy things in the middle of the night. <laughs> I mean, our brains just go. And I have to tell you, if I lay awake in the middle of the night and I start having those thoughts that kind of go in, like, oh, oh and it's catastrophizing, I tell myself, this is crazy thinking at night. <laughs> you know that tomorrow morning you won't be thinking this, you know, this catastrophe, catastrophic thought or this, you know, negative thought. And I have to t really message myself to help calm. I also do a lot of deep breathing, and that belly breathing 
can be incredibly helpful. And I know people can say, well, I've tried that. Just again, it takes time. It's not going to completely get rid of the thoughts that you have at night that keep you awake. But I think labeling the thoughts, these are my nighttime thoughts, and knowing that in the morning they won't look as negative, that is one thing that I know personally helps to calm myself, and I know that it calms some of my patients to really, again, label these as your nighttime worries, but that it's not as bad in the morning. If it is as bad in the morning um, and you still are having lots and lots of worries and having a difficult time calming yourself, that's when you really reach out to seek mental health healthcare. Um, and I think that that's something that more and more people are doing. And the stigma about reaching out for mental health care is actually declining. Because I think everyone knows that this is a bad situation. And so when we're not in COVID, people can say, well, I have such a great life. Why am I distressed? Now you can say, yes, I'm distressed. Everybody is. And that people are, I think, feeling less stigmatized for, for reaching out. And I always tell people it never hurts to reach out to your primary care doctor or find a therapist. There are a lot of things online. It never hurts to reach out just to find somebody to talk to. Colorado Crisis Service is seeing lots more phone calls and you can just talk to somebody and say, is this unusual? Do I need to seek formal mental health care or what am I, it, what I'm experiencing was, with, is within a normal range? Mm -hmm. So Colorado Crisis Services is a really excellent resource for everyone in, the, in Colorado. Great, thank you for that. Um, we've got a few here on testing. Um, so let me start with one for Jude and I have one for a couple of you too. Um, Jude, you're up at CSU, um, which I know is kind of started some of that wastewater testing. Um, how widespread is that testing of wastewater for looking at where the virus is spreading? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think what, what we found is it's emerged as an incredibly useful tool, um, but it, it is part of a larger strategy. So it can inform, it can give you a sense for what general trends are, are um, happening, on, you know, in our case, on a particular campus, you know, within particular residence halls. Uh, but then that needs to be paired with follow-up and, and targeted testing and then isolation of those infected individuals for it to be an effective um, strategy. You know, in terms of broad level surveillance, um, we're doing, or we, there are folks um, uh, at CSU that are doing that testing uh, throughout the state of Colorado. Um, other universities are doing it. And so I, I believe it's becoming more and more widespread. Great. Um, Michelle, this is about testing as well, too, but specifically nasal tests. Um, so, you know, Mary had asked if she's got these symptoms or they, excuse me, have these symptoms, fever, diarrhea, fatigue, would a nasal test necessarily be positive? Let me give you a two part here. Um, and then could you talk about differences between the off-the-shelf saliva tests that's available for home use, how reliable are those? All the tests have a little bit of differences just depending on which one you do. So there is one where there's a nasal test that just goes into part of your nose, the nasopharyngeal that people joke you're doing a brain biopsy because it goes all the way back to your throat. And then there's the saliva test. And so they all have what we call sensitivity and specificity, which are false positives, false negatives. Most of these, um, the nasopharyngeal is the best, most sensitive, most specific, the least number of false positives or false negatives. The nasal has some issue with that, same thing with saliva. So in terms of your symptoms, COVID, even if it's causing symptoms of gastrointestinal disease, if it's causing it, they should be able to pick it up. Symptomatic patients tend to have better chances of testing positive than if you're asymptomatic. There's so much variability that you have to really look at the test and how it's collected. And there's all sorts of nuances to this that we could probably spend a whole hour talking about. But I think it's important to know that if you are having symptoms and you think you have COVID, you got to stay home. You can't keep, even if you have a negative test with those symptoms and potential exposure, you got to stay home. Because I think that's the part of this is that people say, oh, well, I got a negative test. Woohoo, I can do whatever I want. And then they don't wear a mask or they don't follow social distancing, but they could still be infected and spread it unknowingly. So this question is going to follow on that point, Michelle. And I don't know, John, if you want to try to take it or Michelle or Jude or someone. Um, uh, uh, Salitha, I'm unclear about contagion. If exposed to a person who two days later tests positive for COVID-19, 
Do I then quarantine for 14 days? If I don't get sick, am I great to go? Or at contact plus two days, do I get a test? And if not, carry, and if not positive, carry on. I really don't understand the timing of when I'm supposed to do what if you've been contacted about someone who has it. Um, I'm looking, Jude, do you wanna, have you any thoughts on this? Michelle, like who wants to take this? No, no yeah, I will hand off to other qualified panelists. <laughs> Michelle, what should she do or they do? Excuse me, I don't mean to genderize people. So the challenge with this is because, so the um, with any virus, there's an incubation period. That in incubation period can follow a bell curve, right? So we can look at the average, the average incubation period in which somebody that's been exposed that will then become um, symptomatic is about five to seven days. But we have had individuals out to 10 to 14 days. That's where the 14 day quarantine comes into play where Anywhere along this time frame, you could potentially develop symptoms or not, or potentially test positive. Um, certainly, I think getting testing if you're having symptoms is very valuable, but doesn't necessarily change the duration of the quarantine that's recommended. Um, the testing in between, so the problem comes into if you're part of what's called a critical workforce, then it becomes challenging because you feel fine, you're home, and you're thinking, I'm sitting at home doing nothing when there's things I really need to be doing. And so I'll just get a test at day seven. If I'm good to go, I'm good to go. And I think that could be considered, but only under certain circumstances. Again, it's a little complicated. And I know it's challenging to be home 14 days, but it's really based on the scientific curve of this. And it's all about risk in terms of trying to mitigate other people getting disease. Um, and I don't know that I, John might have some further comment, but I, I know it's challenging, but I don't know that we have better data at this point to be able to do it differently. No, the only other comment, and this is part of the challenge of the virus and um, the incubation period, of course, is variable and, and this is asymptomatic period during which people can infect others, which uh, complicates it and uh, makes us uh, very uh, challenging vectors to deal with. I'm going to throw out another complication with this, and, and I'm going to ask you to maybe try to take this on. Um, we have this question, but it's also come up in lots of other episodes, particularly when we've talked about the economics. So is the economic harm a greater and more immediate threat to many families than the virus itself? How are public health and government officials aiming to strike a balance between public health safety and general well-being and those economic trade-offs that are happening? And that is a huge question, um, but any thoughts on that, Jude? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a, th a couple of thoughts. You already mentioned what I'll always start with, which is a, it's a very complex question. Um, you know, I think the uh, casting as an either or is a false dichotomy. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like we can have the economy or health. Um, those things are, are inextricably linked. Um, and, and so what I think some of the research is, is starting to show is um, people aren't going to engage in economic activity i.e. going to restaurants, things that we talked about already in this talk, um, until they feel safe. Uh, and so it is critical that we suppress the virus, that we um, make places safe so that people can go out uh, um, and engage in, in economic activity. Um, and I think we've seen that now in other countries. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of the, the uh, crux uh, of the whole issue. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, you know, different regions experience this differently. Um, we're still trying to understand that data. Um, in terms of the, the policy response, um, you know, one of the key questions that I've been focused on for months actually is, is this issue of how much of people's response is due to policy or just their own voluntary behavior uh, in response to risk. It's, it's a really hard question uh, to answer in this case. Um, there's a lot of people working on it and I'll, I'll just say that you know, it's a mix of the two, um, which is, is, you know, I wish we had clear cut answers for uh, policymakers uh, it would help, uh, you know, decide some of these questions. But uh, yeah, we're working on it. Okay, um, I'm going to share this quote. And then Jude, I want you and maybe Neil, um, and then I've got something for John too to follow on to talk a little bit more about risk and behavior. So David Morenz, who's senior advisor to Dr. Fauci, was quoted, um, I think this was last week, about weighing risk regarding transmission of virus on surfaces. But I think this question about risk, this quote he provides, is really fascinating. And then John, I'm going to ask you about surfaces. Um, so there's just a lot of unnecessary worry out there about these things. 
It's like standing in the middle of a busy freeway with all the traffic around you and asking, what's the chance I'm going to get hit by a meteor? Now there's a chance, but it's pretty low. And don't you have other, better things to worry about? He was quoted as saying. So Neil, let me start with you because you just brought up risk about people's behavior. Um, how would you recommend people approach evaluating their own risk and their behavior? I know it's a very personalized thing. Um, Jude, do you want to start that? And Neil, do you want to come on? Because that part of that, I think, too, is, is some coping stuff. Um, so sorry, is, is the question just responding to that quote? Yeah, and thinking about risk, which you brought up, and people's yeah. behavior. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, they're, uh, you know, they are very linked. So people make decisions based on on their risk. I think um, that quote, I, I had a hard time following it, I think. But, um, you know, if if it's minimizing the, uh, that, that surf, you know, the transmission on surfaces is, is, uh, is an issue. Um, I think one thing that, that we, um, Think a lot about is the salience of risk. So how how salient, how obvious is is risk? How 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 um, on the front of people's minds is it? Um, and I think you know we have some limited capacity to understand very complex risk, and and so that's uh, maybe I'll pass it off to to Neil at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it is a difficult question, and I and my understanding is what they were trying to say is that we have risk all around us and it's a likelihood that they're going to get, you know, the coronavirus um, is like the meteor. I, I mean, look, I, 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 I wish it was like a meteor. <laughs> um, it's not. <laughs> uh, the risk is, is, is really so much greater. Um, and I really think it's about not just protecting yourself, it's about protecting other people. We're in a public health crisis. And I think had we all thought and a lot earlier and a lot sooner and basically been a little bit more, probably a way more stringent, I think we could have been in much better shape. And no, I agree, shutting down the economy, it wasn't, wasn't good. But if we could have done it for a shorter period of time, now everybody's just exhausted with this. I think everybody in the beginning was much more like, okay, we're all in this together and let's kind of do this. But I wish we had been a little, a lot more clear and, and really made some very, maybe, maybe some people might've thought it was draconian. Now this is hindsight, Could, woulda, coulda, shoulda. We didn't shut down as dramatically uh, across the country as I think would have been the preference of our public health officials. And now we're in a situation where it's kind of ebbed and flowed. And I think people are tired and exhausted. But I would just say, look, remember, you're protecting other people in addition to yourself. And we've got to get through this winter and see where things are as we get through this period of time where we have to be indoors. Um, it's not great, but people are, we're all in this. We're all in this. It's not just one group of people. We're all in this. And some are affected more than others. So I think as much as we possibly can to try take a deep breath and recognize that this is a little bit of a marathon this winter. John, that question was a little bit to regards to um, fomite, right? Transmission uh, via surfaces. What is the latest thinking on the likelihood transmission of the virus via surfaces? So just a comment, I think it's probably six, eight weeks ago, we did the uh, session with Shelly Miller on Mm -hmm. airborne transmission. And uh, I had chaired the workshop at the National Academies where we <laughs> took a deep look at uh, modes of transmission, particularly air. And I, I think the evidence is pretty clear that uh, airborne transmission by the smaller particles, the so-called aerosols, is probably what is most um, Im important. And I think particularly as we move uh, indoors, Fomite transmission exists. It's clearly uh, clearly important. The virus can stay uh, viable for a while on surfaces. I'm not sure we've quite resolved how long that might be under different um, circumstances, but um, clearly all the, um, the hand hygiene uh, practices that are recommended should be uh, followed. But I, I, I think that with us going indoors, uh, that uh, airborne transmission by these smaller uh, aerosols that can move across spaces. They can go more than six feet for sure uh, is, uh, is probably gonna be dominant for the months to come. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to maybe try to do two more questions here. I know folks are busy and Neil is completely booked back to back. So Neil, if you drop off, um, we understand. Um, but if folks can just stay on for a couple more questions, I want to try to wrap this up here. We did not get to all of them. John, what are, uh, are plastic face shields effective? So face shields are thought to be not as effective as they might, might think looking at them. They funnel the air, uh, but uh, they don't block the particles. Okay. Jude, um, what have we learned? We had you on earlier talking about mobility um, using data. Um, what have we learned from that since when we've had you on at the start of the pandemic and kind of earlier on about the various stay at home measures? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we learned that, that they, they um, did at least add to, to um, you know, people staying at home. I, I sort of alluded to this earlier. You know, I think now one of the key questions is this, you know, how much of that would have happened in the absence of, of policy? How much of that was induced by policy? Um, that, that's a critical question moving forward. I think uh, one of the, you know, uh, features we've been paying attention to is just the variation around the state. And I think uh, one of the interesting results is we, we've seen this sort of persistent um, either additional time spent at home or less visitation to restaurants, retail stores in the sort of Denver metro area relative to, to some of the other um, outlying communities. So that's sort of the, the high level takeaways from the data so far. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, we get this one all the time. Um, I'm going to start with John, but if others want to comment, I'm welcome. What's the best estimate of how long this pandemic will last? Or as Ed wrote, when will this be over? Yeah, I don't know about a best estimate, but um, I think, you know, when I, when I talk about this, our school is uh, planning on being remote in the spring. I think if we had a uh, an effective vaccine and it were delivered to enough of us um, to reach herd immunity. My optimistic scenario would be the fall. Uh, and uh, I think to have enough of us vaccinated to get to that say 70% level that we need for herd immunity, it's gonna take a while. Uh, so there's much time and, to, and many steps from having a vaccine arrive to us getting back to normal. Any other comments on that? And let me throw one more out here so you all can have one final last word. I appreciate, I know we're going slightly long today, but um, by all means, I'm super excited for all four of you to be here with me. So if anyone wants to comment on when they think this is gonna be over, whether that's happening in where you work or your personal life, or I will give you two options. Um, what has been one of your personal aha moments um, since the start of this pandemic? Something that just kind of changed the way you thought or really just kind of struck you as interesting. I'm um, seeing some eyes to the side. Neil's nodding. Neil, why don't I start with you, Jude, Michelle, and then I'll give John the last word if he wants. So I guess my aha moment as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and the first three months of COVID, we were sprinting. I mean, it felt like we were going 24 seven and my faculty and myself, we were, we were really getting exhausted we have to be able to see this as more of a marathon and that you prepare differently for a marathon. And so having compassion for myself and saying, I need a break, I can't do this today, uh, trying to find respite. It's something that I've been saying that we need to do with our frontline providers is helping them have respite because we can throw mental health services at people. If they're too physically and psychologically exhausted, the mental health services are only but so good. And so I think being kind to ourselves, doing what we need to do, taking breaks when we can, um, and recognizing that we're in it for the long haul. So take a deep breath, keep breathing deeply, and, and love yourself and others that are in your circle. <laughs> yeah, I think that resonates uh, a lot with me. I, I felt very similar uh, throughout this, the, the course of this pandemic. I think the aha moment for me, um, being a sort of data focused, you know, analyst was um, this, this sort of, you know, I was highly focused on the mobility trends. Um, and when I saw those start to increase in late April, May, I was really concerned that we would um, see widespread transmission. And I think it really highlighted the importance of these other uh, protective behaviors. So mask wearing, distancing, 
um, all of those things can matter. We can resume activities um, if if we're um, adherent to those uh, those policies. So just reiterating this point that we've we've been making. Thank you. My aha moment really has been about how we communicate and how getting messaging out to people within the healthcare system with the public at large and how important it is to have that messaging, and especially in a pandemic where we don't have all the information rapidly and how we give that information out. We have highly educated people that should know the science and do know the science and still feel anxiety. And that's a normal response because I think even knowing the science, there's still things that we worry about. And I think that's probably the thing I've with my aha moment of just got to keep up the messaging and keep the consistency, uh, acknowledge their fear. I think that was the piece that was probably the key for me is like acknowledging, like, I get it. I have anxiety too, but we have to make some decisions with what we know and we have to move forward and that could change, but that doesn't mean wrong or awful. It just Thank you, Sasha. And I, I guess as an epidemiologist, I'd really prefer not to be living through the pandemic of our lifetimes. But um, I think uh, one thing I've realized is that, you know, those of us in, in public health can both do science to um, inform us all about what are the best paths and what we are facing and uh, that we have a, a responsibility uh, to do so and to communicated about it. And I, I think looking at the Colorado School of Public Health, we've stepped forward with colleagues at um, other schools and universities like Jude to try and um, do the science and, and through, you know, partnering, for example, with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to reach out to you. And I think that's also been um, really, uh, really, really key. And I think all of us are trying to engage whether, you know, all certainly all of our panelists and many others are trying to do all we can to help the world understand what's going on. It's an important moment for us. Absolutely, thank you. And that word engage, it is about engaging and showing up and not disengaging. So I am very appreciative for all of your leadership. Um, you know, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground today. So not only leadership in the state and what you do um, in your own fields, but for spending the morning with us here Monday morning and answering all of our audience questions. So thank you tremendously to all of our guests today. Double thank you to John. Um, he's been a great partner. The Colorado School of Public Health has been a great partner in helping us put this together and would not be possible without them at all. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. As John mentioned, we will be back on November 9th. So Monday, November 9th, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time, we're gonna do a COVID-19 flu face-off. Really not a face off, but we are going to unpack both COVID-19 and the <laughs> flu and the vaccines and everything again. So come back on November 9th. And in the meantime, get your flu vaccine, as John said, you know what I mean? So um, we encourage you to come back here um, and join us on November 9th. Um, we may try to get some of these questions answered in the follow up. Um, folks are really busy, but there are a few here that we, we may try to get you some answers for. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I think Nicole dropped a few things in the chat there. So make sure you check out those links and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.